Thank you. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Hornby. Hi. It's good to be here today. Uh, it's morning, and I'm uh, still waking up. Um, long trip yesterday. We came from Tyang Tyanganega Mohawk Territory in Ontario, where I've spent the last couple of months which has been a, a wonderful experience. I was in a, a very well-equipped and suitable laboratory um, in Tyanganega, and um, working with a great team. And really, I'm at home in a lab more than I am in public, public speaking. Um, I'm a lab rat by nature, and. Um, I've been kind of dragged into the role of public speaking and education because I've been doing this a long time. Uh, almost 20 years researching the efficacy and safety of cannabis. Efficacy is a medical term. It sounds like effect, um, but it's a little different because efficacy is the desired effect, meaning it'll the product will do what you say it can do. And I'm going to be talking about that today. Um, Cheryl gave me, I want, at first I want to thank a few people. Um, Tim Barnhart and Kathy O'Coin that are both here in the audience. Um, Tim has been a wonderful guide to myself, um, organizing NIMCA at a lab that I very much like. <clears throat> And Kathy is his sidekick who keeps everything organized and running smoothly. Um, a tremendous role. I want to talk to you today about uh, cannabis. And I'm not, I'm the, the president of Hedron Analytical Inc., which sounds like a, a corporation, but it's not. It's just a small R&D company that I've been in charge of for 20 years, and I do not make a lot of money from this company. I'm, like I say, I'm a lab rat. I focus on research, and I'm not here to talk about how you can make money from cannabis. That I'm, I'm not good at making money. I'm good at spending it. So I'm a research and development guy. Yeah, I started out a long time ago I'm not a medical doctor, I do research. I have uh, a doctorate degree in human pathology. And I've always focused my attention on natural product type medicine. I, they sent me to India for a year in my doctorate training. I had a very high incidence of oral cancer. And it was caused by a chewing tobacco that they use called the beetle quid. The tobacco leaf and they wrap it up in a piper beetle leaf and a tube of this nut, um, which is a stimulant nut, and they get oral cancer like crazy. And we were there to try to intervene on the cancer, giving vitamin A and beta carotene. And I looked inside of more than 2,000 mouths and had a special camera to look at the oral lesions. Anyway, that, that study went on for a, about a year. And it, my thinking changed in India. I was trained in pharmaceutical type medical um, science. And I saw a lot of old people in India that weren't on heart meds or antipsychotic medicine. They were using natural herbal medicine. And my thinking switched away from synthetic pharmaceutical type medicine to natural product medicine. <clears throat> and I've been studying that ever since. And cannabis is, it's a very different type of medicine. It's not, it's definitely not synthetic. I, I don't go anywhere near synthetic um, <clears throat> cannabinoids or highly purified cannabinoids. I like the, uh, the natural product medicine. 
And I came up in time with this kind of philosophy that drugs should be t tested on the people that make them. If, if you made a vaccine, you test it first, try it on yourself, try it on your kids, see if it works. My body has been my laboratory for many years. <clears throat> and with cannabis, I guess the greatest thing about working with cannabis is you can't kill anybody. If, if that was true, my whole family would be dead, including the dog. Because <laughs> um, I, I experiment a lot with um, my own body, and uh, I'm still alive. In fact, I, I am a living testimonial to the use of cannabis because 2016 was absolutely the worst year of my life. I uh, fell off a balcony in Spain, broke my leg, my elbow in two places. And then, I guess four or five months later, I slipped on the ice in Vancouver, and spent seven hours in brain surgery. They, I think they put a chip in there. But um, anyway, um, all that I used for the recovery from both of those injuries was um, Spanish, hemp trichome, which is a high CBD containing cannabis. And the, in the hospital, my leg injury, they, the cannabis synergized very well with the opiate drugs that they gave me, but as soon as I left the hospital, I never filled an opiate prescription. All I used was the, the cannabis for both the injuries. <clears throat> and I can dance, I, I still have hair, and, I got a few dents in my head, but I think my, my thinking is back to where it, it, it always was in the kind of the, the weird department. And this is what I mean, efficacy, the desired effect. Cannabis has been used for this many illnesses and has been shown to be a desired effect in that many illnesses, which is unheard of for any other type of medicine. <clears throat> I say that cannabis is an unusual type of medicine because it is. It, um, it affects so many different uh, human physiological properties and also um, psychological properties as well. It's unheard of in, in the medical realm, this, this type of effect. And there are, there's a, a few illnesses that I have focused on over the years around cannabis. One is cancer, which I cannot seem to get away from. My early training was in cancer. Now it's come back again um, in the field of cannabis medicine. Where, where cannabis is highly effective in treating cancer. And you'll know, say, um, what do I take? How much do I take? Uh, these are the questions I hear in my public speaking is, number one, how do I access it? And number two, how much do I take? I'm not gonna talk about these things today. I'm just gonna focus on um, pain mostly because pain is, it's an illness, and it, it, it's a very broad spectrum type illness as well. And it leads into so many other things. Um, I had my lab in a dispensary for five years in Vancouver. It was the second dispensary ever to open in Vancouver. I worked with the first one too. Um, a lady named Hillary Black started that one, and she was a tremendously gifted diplomat that ran the dispensary with no problems from police or fire or robbery or anything like that. And in my having my lab in the dispensary for five years, I, I learned a lot about the the medical effect of cannabis, and I'm really not sure what they mean by recreational cannabis because the medicine is so profound uh, with this plant. 
Um, I think that they're, they're saying that calling it recreational is a ploy. I see it as a ploy of the pharmaceutical industry so that we don't take it seriously as a medicine, go out and have fun on it, but it's not a serious medicine. Well, to hell it's not. It's yeah. the most useful, profoundly efficacious herbal medicine known to man. And that's why it's been banned for 90 years. 80% of the people at the dispensary were using cannabis to treat one type of pain or another. Um, pain is very difficult to diagnose. You don't know how much a person is feeling. and um, There's no real analytical measure for pain. You judge it mostly on a person, what the person says and what you see. And it can come in many different forms, physical, emotional, spiritual. How do you get spiritual pain? You end up in a residential school, for example, and uh, your spirituality is twisted or um, consumed by another type that's not your own. But pain is really, in my simple mind, the heart of the addictive process. Um, when you're in pain, you take a painkiller, and unfortunately, the best painkillers are what we call opiates, um, but they're highly addictive and they kill people. And when I say about cannabis, um, there's never been a, a medical record or any uh, evidence directly relating cannabis to any death um, caused by cannabis alone. It's always mixed with something else. Because cannabis is really a, an antitoxin. I, I say it's a food because it should be eaten, and it should be eaten daily, and it's really part of our diet. Um, when you consume cannabis daily, you tend to eat good, sleep good, and shit good. And that's, that's my medical talk for the day. <laughs> Treating... Um, Pain with cannabis, it's virtually equal to any uh, painkiller. You have to, I can get into smoking it versus eating it. Um, pain relief is actually better in eating it because you work under a five to six hour dome of, of pain relief, whereas you smoke it, you'll cycle in your day of pain relief. You get pain relief here, not here, here, not here. So in eating it, you blanket uh, a longer term of pain relief. So I recommend eating it or a suppository, which is not that popular in North America for some reason, but suppository is a very effective administrative route. Anyway, I've been through this before in a talk in North Battleford and almost I guess it was last February um, in Saskatchewan. This is a, a major problem. And a lot of it can be alleviated with cannabis use. A cannabis way of life can put a serious dent in this op opiate addiction, opiate overdose death thing that's happening in Alberta and Saskatchewan, every other province. My home province in BC, the average terrorist attack is happening every week in Vancouver with 25 deaths a week from opiate overdose. The numbers, I can't even keep track of the numbers now. It's, it's so high and devastating. And I, I, I know for a fact that cannabis can get people away from opiate drugs and get them through withdrawal and they can lead a better quality of life using cannabis than you can with opiates and deal with your pain as well. It's 1030. Oh, that's my computer telling me what time it is. <laughs> <laughs> It'll remind me at 11 too. <laughs> this is... Um, the, this is a, from a CDC report on a number of opiate deaths. And First Nations people are the 
prescribed twice the number of opiate drugs than non-indigenous people. What, what's going on? I put what the fuck here because I don't, I don't, you know, it, it blows me blows my mind that this has happened. Um, are First Nations people in more pain? They have um, more trauma? Maybe. Anyway, I'll talk a little bit about how cannabis works. I'll bring a little bit of science. I'll spare you of my usual talks around cannabinoid profiles and so on, but this goes back to ancient Chinese philosophy, the yin and the yang. Um, the Chinese noticed light and dark, hot and cold, off or on, positive, negative in nature. Then they put that, that into the, the human physiology. There's positive, negative, um, on or off, stimulation, inhibition. Um, oxidation, antioxidation, but they all, those are polar opposites and when they balance out they bring about homeostasis and there couldn't be anything more important in biology than homeostasis which is the balancing act. See the nervous system has um, in inhibitory and stimulatory um, components that bring about homeostasis. And natural product people have been talking about homeostasis balance in, in the human physiology since they, they began selling natural products. But now they have it in cannabis. It is the, the nature's way of bringing about physiological balance. This is a, a healthy system, would be in homeostatic balance. We've got the stars here as representing neurotransmitters that, that could be in the nervous system, that could be cytokines in the immune system, um, or hormones in the endocrine system. All of these systems are physiological systems that require balancing. Uh, to, to be proper in, in function. Then if you get, say you get brain inflammation or you get a bacterial infection in your brain, that system will go out of balance. One thing changes, everything changes, like a grow room. Then if we put a, say we get a headache, we put a pharmaceutical drug on that, we talk, trying to maintain that balance, but it, it doesn't always homeostatic balance because the, the cannabinoids work from these nexus points here. That's the way the, the receptors and the, the mechanism of action always will try to balance out that system. And if you get nausea, you hook another pharmaceutical drug on. And after a while, you put another one on for constipation because you're taking an opiate for the headache. And then you stress the system and you're still not bringing it into homeostatic balance. But all the time, the cannabinoids are working from those nexus points attempting to bring the system back into balance. Whether it's your, your central nervous system, immune system, or endocrine system, it's all, always trying to be back into balance. And if I can get this to run. You see how the, the cannabinoids will attempt to maintain a homeostatic balance. That's why they, it won't always work for cancer. It won't always work for everything because what you're trying to do is just balance out the system. It's not particularly attacking any a symptom rather than working the whole system. <coughs> Cannabinoids, um, they're a balancing act. They, they tend to 
to the system rather than the symptom. And that, that is a, a healthy system in, in homeostatic balance. And another thing that, oh, you might wonder why when you smoke pot, you get the fear and paranoia, and you say, oh, this is, the doctor says you're balancing it out, but I'm getting scared and I'm, I'm getting stupid and from, from smoking pot. Um, that's the effect of THC. THC, God bless it, is a very effective medicine, but it's also crosses over to your serotonin receptor, crosses to the GABA receptor, and it affects those receptor systems. So you do get a high, experience a high from THC. Um, but all the time the THC is attempting to balance out your, your physiology, believe it or not. But cannabidiol from the hemp plant, for example, uh, is really the ultimate balancer. If, if you take it orally or by suppository or smoke it, it'll balance out your system. That's why um, cannabidiol or high CBD from the hemp plant um, will be in virtually every, any virtually all herbal medicines in the future because it will bring about the balance and then you can put in the, the hypericin from St. John's wort or the other actives from other herbal products to do their thing, but the balancing act will come from the, the cannabidiol. So there's another interesting thing about cannabinoids that take them away from the standard synthetic medical realm. It's called the entourage effect, or synergy. If you highly purify or synthesize THC, you'll get a very, very different effect in the human body than you'll get from an extracted THC at the same concentration. One time I made a, what I call the bald and hairy prep, um, using my body as a, as a laboratory once again. I made equal THC and, and um, dosage of THC. One was with just THC by itself, the other was THC with its brothers and sisters, a, a full spectrum type extract. I took the purified THC on one day, noted its effect, and I took the full spectrum THC a couple of days later. The THC by itself was boring. It, um, I got some pain relief, a bit hungry, but it wasn't anything like the full spectrum um, THC at the same concentration. With the full spectrum THC, I got the euphoria, I got the hungry, I got the comfort and the, the, the full cannabis effect, but from the THC by itself, it wasn't anything like that. Um, once again, my my case against synthetic versus natural product medicine. Natural product medicine, THC will be there with its CBD, CBN, there's 140 odd cannabinoids and the terpenoids as well, which are all made on the flower of the cannabis plant. This is the terpenoids or terpenes are the other half of the cannabinoid medicine, very important for mood, the receptor active, the important for pain, for cancer, for all types of relief. Um, cannot forget about the other part of the medicine that's actually um, in the trichome, the same part of the flowering, part of the plant. I'm getting reacting too much. Um, anyway, the, the plant, cannabis medicine works best as an extract with all of the cannabinoids in full spectrum light prep. Um, yeah, recreation, can you spot the difference? Recreational, medicinal, I don't see any difference. This is a bit of scientific work on 
how um, CBD affects other receptors and brings about that type of modulation. And back to the opiates, the, these are more natural opiates here, morphine, codeine. These are the killer ones, hydrocodone, fentanyl, oxycodone, methadone. Methadone is involved in what roughly one-third of all opiate deaths. It's a major killer, and it was put out as a, a harm reduction agent uh, for heroin. And it's as addictive as heroin. It kills people. It's not a good harm reduction agent. Cannabis is... I'm, I'm counting it because it's true. It, it is probably the most useful, beneficial harm reduction agent we could ever possess. Um, and it, we did a study in 2013 um, at a dispensary called Eden. It was in the war zone in Vancouver, in Maine and Hastings area in Chinatown, and where a lot of the trafficking and the opiate addiction occurs at that part of Vancouver. And we put up a sign in the dispensary, anybody addicted to methadone, come and see us behind the counter. And within two days, we had 20 people signed up, all of them addicted to methadone, attending a local methadone clinic. So we called it liquid handcuffs because they had to come to the clinic every day to pick up methadone. If they didn't take their methadone, they'd go into withdrawal. So it was easy for them to come to the dispensary after picking up the methadone dose. And they would come to the dispensary, pick up a standardized oral um, capsule of cannabis. They would take two or three, depending on what sort of dosage they needed. But they took them in front of the dispensary employee. That way we could be sure of compliance that they were taking their cannabis medicine. We would do a, a questionnaire about pain relief, withdrawal symptoms, and so on, but we saw them daily. We did that every day for three months. And over the three months, we saw a dramatic decrease in the opiate consumption. We were tracking their medical records and so on, doing urine samples. Dramatic decrease in the opiate consumption and we got two of them off completely. All, all of them reduced by at least 50%. That was the easy part. The last 50% was the hard part. Nevertheless, significant reduction in opiate consumption. One thing we noted that the ones that were most successful are the ones that interacted with the dispensary employee the most. And we've that human interaction is very important in opiate withdrawal and cessation. So our new model, of, we've been planning to start a new opiate reduction study um, with an indigenous population, somewhere in a high risk population is best because the stats work out better. But anyway, we need funding to do this, not a hell of a lot, um, but we want to get started and we will work it through a dispensary. Um, the NIMCA dispensary, Legacy 420 in, in Ontario, we can do a nucleus from that, but we want to create a model of opiate reduction using cannabis as a harm reduction agent. And uh, we take a dispensary in a high-risk uh, indigenous reserve, preferably with a methadone clinic around there, because that makes life a lot easier in terms of the research. Um, like I just pointed out, they have to attend the methadone clinic every day, so it allows us to get a better idea of compliance. And we employ indigenous uh, addictions workers. Like I say, it's key to getting people through withdrawal that they interact with a, a, a human on the other side. 
And at the end of our three-month study, we continued with the people in the study. They continued to be clients of the dispensary, but we didn't, we didn't give them anything really tangible to hang on to after they got off the opiates. But now we can. With legalization, we, there's so many jobs. Um, you can, um, everything from growing to extracting, packaging, working in a dispensary, and people can find something tangible, meaningful work after they, they quit opiates. I, I consider that cannabis is more than a medicine, it's really a way of life because it's so useful. I felt proud sitting behind the cinder blocks made from hemp, hempcrete at the Nimka table over there because you can make houses out of it. And you can make petroleum, you can make food, you can make so many different products from cannabis. It's unlimited and um, it's better than being on opiates. And cannabis will provide uh, a better way better quality of life than being addicted to opiates. We've seen this work. We know it's a, a profoundly useful medicine and um, just don't be afraid of it. Use it. If you do get high, which I often fear overdosing a lot of old folk my age because if they take an oral dose and they get scared and they, they'll never go back to it. So because it's so, so useful as a medicine, if anyone is new to it, start microdosing it. Start a very small dosage and work your way up into where, where you find that, that it's alleviating or uh, helping you with your symptoms. And often what I do when working with people with cancer, I will put them onto a medical cannabis regimen and then track their diagnostics because in Canada we have probably world-class diagnostics for, of disease, but we really don't know how to treat it in the most effective way. So we monitor diagnostics and then adjust the, the cannabis regimen. And I really like people that when they're taking cannabis therapeutically, they experiment with their dosage, try different uh, different administrative routes, different dosages. Keep, keep shifting it around, eat it, poke it up your bum, rub it on your body, load up on, on THC and CBD if you have ca cancer as much as you can stand. Um, and like, like I say, start small and work up. But anyway, I'll be here for another day and you can grab me on, I can hopefully help you with anything that uh, you might have questions about. Thank you very much for listening. You've been a wonderful audience, and uh, good luck.